All right, so let's get started because we've got a lot to do today. Today is uh, the Grotrian diagram and term symbols. So how do we keep track of all of these electrons, each one of them having four quantum numbers and each one of them being in an orbit that might or might not have a little magnetic spin to it and the electrons have a little magnetic spin and this creates a fair bit of complexity whenever you're dealing with an atom. And where does that complexity show up? It shows up in the spectrum. Okay. Now, atomic spectra are pretty simple, but at the same time, if you want to understand the details, it can be kind of complex. And so one of the ways we keep track of those different energy levels and the different states of the atoms is by using term symbols. So we're going to uh, unpack term symbols today, uh, sort of the notation of atomic uh, orbitals and electrons in, in those orbitals. We can't do term symbols without electron configurations. So that's why we spent the whole last time understanding the electron configuration. And now we'll, we'll, we will determine how many combinations of electron spins there are. Now you could draw pictures of this. You could draw uh, an electron configuration and then draw all the little spins, ups and downs. And if you've got completely filled subshells and completely filled shells, all the spins are paired up. There's really only one way to make a neon atom in the ground state, right? Because neon has, you know, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and everything's all paired up in the orbitals. All the spins cancel out, and so that's going to be a very simple electron cloud. Everything's so symmetric. But you get to something like carbon, where there's two electrons in the p subshell, and you can put those in the px, py, p, xpz, pypz. You could have all of them spin up. You could have one spin up and one spin down. You could have the up and the x and the down and the y, or you could have the up and the y and the down and the x. And so it gets pretty cumbersome if you're going to try to draw all those little pictures. And whenever I tried to do it that way in graduate school and even undergrad, I was never assured that I got all of the pictures. Right? Because how do you know? You've got all the pictures there, but when do you know you have all the pictures? And how are you sure that you don't have the same picture drawn twice and miscount? So I do not do the little picture drawing method, but you'll see that in some of the books. You'll see all the little electron spins and they're drawn in different colors and so on. And we're just not going to do it that way. We're going to use the Klebsch-Gordon series. And the Klebsch-Gordon series is just a series of sets that you do. There's three of them. And you go from a max value and a min value and plus or minus one in between. And we'll do a systematic way to come up with all the term symbols. Uh, it's the same every time. It's a bit tedious. But it's less tedious, I think, than drawing the pictures and wondering if you got them all or not. So our goal today is to get through the Grotrian diagram and the Klebsch-Gordon series to learn about term symbols so that we can understand how we label the different energy levels of the atoms. And then we'll see an example of that with the mercury atomic emission spectrum that's in these fluorescent tube lights. And so you can take a diffraction grating and put it in a Cheez-Its cracker box and make a spectrometer. And you can aim it at these tube lights and you can see the atomic emission uh, of the mercury. And you can see the line spectra of an atom. So this is the line spectrum of, of hydrogen. This was one of the mysteries that classical physics could not explain. They knew that hydrogen had one electron and one nucleus, and they had no idea what kept the electron out of the nucleus. They knew the electron was negatively charged. They knew the nucleus was positive. Why did the electron not fall into the nucleus? Even if you put an electron in, around a nucleus and have it spin around, you've got a charged particle that's accelerating constantly. It's turning, and it would constantly emit light, and it would constantly lose energy, and it would just spiral into the nucleus. As it's emitting light and slowing down, it would emit all wavelengths of light. And so you would see a smear of light, but that's not what we observed. When we looked at hydrogen, we saw specific transitions. We saw specific photons at specific wavelengths coming out, and we had no explanation for this. And this is what Schrodinger solved with his Schrodinger equation, was the hydrogen atom. Uh, he solved it uh, using that wave idea from de Broglie. And so he uh, was able to solve for the positions of those photons and even the intensities using the transition moment integral. So that's why we're covering that. That was really the hydrogen atom spectrum was was really the first solid uh, you know, result that really tied quantum mechanics to spectroscopy. Um, Planck's 
given credit for solving the black body radiator problem. And that's true. It, it solved the black body radiation, but you know, there may be lots of functions that solve this continuum of uh, emission. But this was such a specific result, and Schrodinger's result matched it so well that this really was a huge support for quantum mechanics. So the energy level differences are the differences between the Schrodinger equation solved for those different quantum states. We're talking about the n quantum number, that principal quantum number. And then the population of those energy levels was governed by Boltzmann's distribution. So these should be familiar uh, equation designations that you've seen before. There is more than just the visible spectrum in hydrogen. We have all of these other results, and they have their different names, but based on the scientists that published those results. So even before we had quantum theory, we had experimental results. And so these were the, the scientists that discovered these different series of lines in, in hydrogen. So we had Balmer and Lyman. Lyman is in the, is in the UV. You see up there wavelength. 100 nanometers. So the Lyman series is in the UV, Balmer series is in the visible, Passion is in the near infrared, and brackets a little further into the infrared. And so we can assign series of integers to these, and Rydberg did that. So there's a Rydberg equation that matches this, and he said you can use you know, you know ratios, one over these quantum numbers squared. He didn't call them quantum numbers, but he called them this integer series. And you can match these lines exactly. But he had no idea what those numbers were. And that was one of the first results of explaining the spectrum. They identified that, that integers can explain this spectrum, but they had no idea what those integers might be. And so then uh, along came Schrodinger and said, well, we call these quantum numbers, and these are discrete jumps between energy levels. Now, Schrodinger absolutely hated this idea of jumping because we didn't know and still to this day don't know what causes the jump. Light comes in, the electron jumps, absorbs that photon of light, but what is it about the interaction of light and this electron? We still don't know about this quantum jumping. We can talk about it in probabilistic terms. We can say it has a certain probability of absorbing, but we can't say that electron on that atom will absorb this photon. We can only do it by the transition moment integral, which gives us a probability of absorption. So the different heights of the peaks are just probabilities, the relative probabilities of that absorption happening. In fact, Schrodinger said, if we can't get rid of all this damned quantum jumping, I'd be sorry I ever got involved in all of this. Because <laughs> he wanted a theory that told us about that. That's a quote from his paper. <laughs> so he solved the position of the peaks, the intensities of the peaks, but still no one to this day has solved this solution of why this electron will absorb this photon. And it's, it's just like you can know the voting patterns of people in general, but you can't say how this person's going to vote. You have no idea what's going to happen. So that's kind of the way I think of it. You can describe it probabilistically, but individually you have no idea. So here's that same plot turned sideways, and you can see the energy level diagram. So the Lyman series starts, if we're talking about absorption, starts at the n equals 1 quantum number and goes to 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And you can see how those lines start out big and then they get closer and closer together. Then the Balmer series is in the visible region. So the visible lines for hydrogen are uh, starting at the n equals 2 and going to 3, to 4, to 5. If we're talking about absorption, if we're talking about emission, there are lines that are at the 3, 4, and 5 dropping down to 2. So all of them are hitting the energy, the n equals 2 level. You won't see that unless you have a really hot atom. And so these are done in electrical discharge tubes. So you run an electrical current through a hydrogen gas. Some of those molecules break apart and have hydrogen atom. And then some of those hydrogen atoms get ionized. And when the electron lands back on that hydrogen, it drops through all of the orbitals. And as it drops down, eventually it'll go from a 3 to 2 level, and that'll be in the visible range, and you'll see that photon. Or it might go from the, from the 4 level straight to the 2, and you'd see that also in the visible range. Okay. But eventually it goes from the 2 to the 1, and that's in the UV. So you wouldn't see that one without a spectrometer. So let's talk now about the Grotrian diagram. It's one of your vocabulary words. And it's a little bit different. Last set of notes, you saw what a, a, a diagram that looked like a Grotrian diagram, but it wasn't. It really doesn't have a name. It was the 
orbital energies plotted on, on an energy spectrum. Uh, we call it the Aufbau filling scheme or the building up filling scheme. So I would, I would, if I had to pick a name for that kind of plot, I would call it an Aufbau plot, a building up plot where you've got the orbital energy. But we are leaving that plot behind. We're going to a Grotrian diagram and they look similar, but they're not. Okay, so let me just emphasize that. So this is the Grotrian diagram for hydrogen. You see how it looks like that Aufbau filling scheme? And for the hydrogen atom, you could argue with me and say it is the same because it only has one electron. And so if I put the electron in the p orbital, it's essentially the, the you would think of it as, well, that's the energy of the p orbital, but it's not. It's the energy of the hydrogen atom with its electron in a p orbital. So in a Grotrian diagram, we're talking about the energy of the whole atom. This will be really obvious when we get to helium. Okay, so if you're confused by hydrogen, don't worry about it. It is a Grotrian diagram. Every one of those energy levels is the energy level of the whole atom. Okay. Now notice, let me go back one. Notice this, uh, this spectroscopic results. The spectroscopic results are, um, look at the selection rules. These are the energy levels. This is n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. Notice we can go from 3 to 2, 4 to 2, 5 to 2. We can go 3 down to 1, 4 down to 1. So the selection rules on n are unrestricted. You can have any delta n. That hasn't been the case in the past. For the particle in the box, we had delta n was plus or minus 1, 3, 5. We couldn't have plus or minus 2. But we can for an atom, that, that shell, we can go from the fifth shell down to the first shell, or the fifth to the second, or the third to the first. So, yeah. so the, the selection rules on delta N, those are unrestricted. But now we have this Grotrian diagram, we can see going from the S column, which is the first column of levels, the P column is the second, the D column is the third, and the F column is the fourth. Can you tell me from this diagram, or can you see in the diagram, the, the L selection rules? So going from an S to P or P to D, can we go from an S to a D or an S to an F? Looking at that diagram, it doesn't look that way. And so there is a, there is a restricted energy level, or a restricted um, selection rule, I should say. So delta L is plus or minus one only, and we see that because we're going from... Uh, going between adjacent columns of, uh, of atoms. So this atom has a, has a, a P-type character to it, and we can go from L equals uh, 1 to L equals 0. So that's a delta L of minus 1 if we're going from right to left. If it's absorption and we're going from an S to a P, then that would be a delta L of plus 1. But I don't see any lines that connect D to S. That would be a delta L of uh, plus 2 or minus 2, and I don't see one going from F to S, which would be a plus or minus 3. So L is restricted to plus or minus 1. Now, this makes sense. In classical physics, we have conservation of angular momentum. That's part of the way why you can balance a bicycle. <laughs> okay, And we also have conservation of angular momentum at the quantum level. So this is one rule in physics that is preserved all the way down into the quantum realm and that is this conservation of angular momentum. And light has one unit of angular momentum, so when it comes into an orbital, what is the angular momentum quantum number? It's L. And so L can go up or down by one unit because light has one unit of angular momentum. Okay. Now, if you could do Raman spectroscopy on atoms, what do you think the selection rules would be with Raman for the L quantum number? Plus or minus two. Yes, plus or minus two and zero. Yeah, so you could have uh, um, the uh, photon of light that's incident and the photon of light that's scattered cancel each other out in terms of angular momentum, and so you could go up and down within the S or within the P or within the D, but you could jump from, in fact, you'd have to jump if you're going, uh, changing the angular momentum quantum number, you'd have to jump by two. So you'd have to go from S to D or D to S, or you go from P to F or F to P if you were doing a Raman experiment on an atom. Most of the time, Raman is, is used in the vibrational spectroscopy, so we don't really talk much about Raman in, at, in atomic spectroscopy. But there's no reason why it, it couldn't happen. 
Now let's look at the Grotrian diagram for helium. Notice it looks a little different. Okay, we have two electrons now. So we're going to have to talk about how those electron spins couple. So we're going to have a net spin. That's one of your vocabulary words. It's the net spin on an atom. And it's the sum of all of those spins of the electrons. And then here we see the Grotrian diagram for helium. We, we need to think about the electron configurations. And so this is the ground state. And the whole last lecture, we were coming up with the ground state electron configurations for the atom. So what is the electron configuration for this energy level here for helium? It's pretty easy. 1s2. 1s2, yes. And this is the S column. So all of these are, are have two electrons in, an, in S orbitals, but they don't have to be the same S orbital. So this one, what do you think, if, if both electrons are still in an s orbital, what do you think the electron configuration is for this one? 1s, 2s. So I have an electron in the 1s and an electron in the 2s. That's cool. And it's a higher energy because the whole atom is now at an excited state. And that's the energy level for that type of helium where there's an electron in the 1s and an electron in the 2s. That is not the energy level for the 2s uh, orbital. You see how confusing that could be if you were thinking that? That is not the energy for the 2s orbital. That is the energy of the helium atom that has one electron in the s, 1s, one electron in the 2s. Okay. So each one of these energy levels has a different electron configuration. Okay. What about this third one up here? It's even more it's even higher in energy. Okay, that's going to be 1s, 3s. Okay, I heard some people saying 2s, 3s. That would be even higher because both electrons are excited. So we kind of go through exciting just one electron at a time, and then we might have other energy levels where both electrons are excited, and that would be even higher in energy. So we just start with, in most of these growth tree diagrams, that's the easy part, is you just change one electron and move it up. <laughs> and, and you start at the bottom of these columns, and that would be the, the, the lowest way to make that particular uh, atom. So let's see if we can make one that has, has this P character to it. So what kind of excited helium atom could I make that, that would have something that's related to a P orbital? Let's leave that first electron in the 1s and put the second electron in the p orbital. So that's going to be 1s, 2p. Makes sense? Okay. And the next one, what do you think? It's got, still got p character, 1s, 3p, and then 1s, 4p, 1s, 5 You notice how they get closer and closer together because those p orbitals, as they add more energy to that atom, they're, they also would get closer and closer together. So, but those are not the energy levels for the p orbitals. They're energy levels for the whole atom that have this configuration of 1s, 2p, 1s, 3p, 1s, 4p. Okay. This one, now that you've got the trend, ought to be easy. This is 1s. Now you've got to figure out what d orbital is it. So what's the first available d orbital? 3d. 3d, exactly. So 1s, 3d. And you may say, well, why isn't there a 4D? Well, there is one. It's just not drawn on this diagram. It, it gets crammed together as you get to the top, so you can't really see all of them. So they've just shown the ones that can easily be drawn. Okay. And then here, which is the first F orbital? Right. So that would be 1S, 4F. And that would be the energy of that one. Now, why do we have this left side of the chart and the right side of the chart? Because the right side has some S, P, Ds, and Fs as well. Think about these electron spins. Okay. So what's the net spin on a helium? Zero, because you've got a spin up electron and a spin down electron. And they have to be spin up and spin down at the ground state because they're in the same orbital. But what if I put that ele second electron in the 2s orbital? They're in different orbitals now, so I could have both of them be spin up. 
What's the net spin in that situation? So it's a half plus a half. Yeah, so it's a spin of one. So if they're unpaired, you have a spin of one. If they're paired, you have a spin of zero. So paired S1 equals one half, S2 equals minus one half. Oh gosh, I'm running out of room. The, the sum of those is equal to zero. And so the net spin is zero for the ones on the left. The ones on the right have unpaired. S1 equals S2 equals one half, right? And so then the sum is equal to one. Now, I've got a lot of S's on this chart. The ones at the top of the Grotrian diagram are capital S's, and those are terms. We call those terms. I'm using these little S's for the spin of the electron. Sometimes you see M sub S. Um, there's really no letter for the net spin, so I, I'm really at a loss for that. And it's, but there is a, a, um, there is a use for this. We, we call it multiplicity, and so 2S... Actually, it's the multiplicity that doesn't have a number. 2s plus 1 is the multiplicity. And so when I take an s equals 1, and I multiply by 2, and add 1, I get 3. So the multiplicity equals 3 for these on the right, where we have unpaired spins. And that whenever that multiplicity is 3, what is 3 of something? It's a triplet. And so that's where that up there at the top it says triplet states. That multiplicity is being shown. And that right there means that this right here, this energy level right here, notice how close it is to that one in energy. It's probably the same electron configuration, but the thing that's different is that the electrons are, are unpaired. So this is 1s, 2s, but we have a spin up, let's just say a spin up electron and a spin up electron. Over here we have 1s, 2s, and we have a spin up electron and a spin down electron. Same electron configuration, but different spin configuration. And if we have spin equals 0, what is 2 times 0 plus 1? That's equal to 1, and that's a singlet. Oh. And so the ones on the left, those singlet states, have paired spins. The ones on the right are triplet states and have unpaired spins. Yes? Oh, for the singlet mm -hmm. ground state, why does it affect the energy level so much when it's uh, unpaired compared to the singlet? The, um, the triplet states only drop a little bit, uh, but the ground state has to be paired up in this particular atom. And so it's, uh, you know, it's just so much lower in energy because it's the ground state. We have both electrons in that 1s orbital. And so exciting one to the, to the 2s orbital takes quite a bit of energy. So if we just leave the electrons in the same spin, but move one of them straight up to the 2s, that takes the whole atom to a much higher energy, and that's what you see right here, this one, okay? But then if we unpair those electrons, it only drops a little bit. You see, these essentially are the, these are the same, 1s, 2s, 1s, 2s. But this is spin paired, this is spin unpaired. And so unpairing those spins only changes it a very little, yeah. It's when it drops to the ground state that you have this huge change. Yes? So if it's in the Yes, if the, if the atom is in a singlet state, those, those electrons are paired, and the net spin is zero. Okay. And if it's in a triplet state, then those spins are unpaired. In fact, you can just take this multiplicity and just subtract one, and that's the number of unpaired electrons you have. 
right? So if you've got a singlet, subtract one, you get zero unpaired electrons. If you're a triplet, subtract one, and you've got two unpaired electrons. What if you're in a quartet? Yeah, quartet is four, subtract one, you have three unpaired electrons. What if you just have hydrogen by itself and it's got one unpaired electron? It would be a doublet. So a doublet is multiplicity of two, subtract one, you have one unpaired electron. And that's why it's 2s plus 1. The 2s gets rid of the halves. You know, the, it's 1 half. You multiply those by 2. to get, So you're counting up the number of electrons and adding 1. And so that number of electrons is 2 times the net spin. So this is the Grotrian diagram for, for helium. Now we can look at this diagram and see if our delta N selection rules hold, because now we have a multi-electron atom. So is N still unrestricted? All of those transitions are spectrally allowed transitions that we see. So do we see jumps from higher end states down to lower end states? For Look at the P to S transitions. So this is a, uh, a 2P, that's a 3P, that's a 4P. So these are different shells. N equals 2, N equals 3, N equals 4, going down to N equals 1. So yeah, it looks like N is still unrestricted. What about delta L? Is delta L still restricted to plus or minus one? Yeah, so the atoms have this S, P, D character, and we're only dropping from S to P or P to S. We're only going D to P or D to, we don't have F on here. Yeah, we do have F. They just have a line drawn there because it's too busy, but we could draw a line between D and F. So yeah, it looks like delta L is still restricted to plus or minus one. So that's good. But now we have this triplet to singlet. Do we see any transitions from triplet to singlet? No. And so that's, that's, uh, that's a selection rule, a symmetry selection rule. You don't have triplet to singlet transitions or singlet to triplet transitions. They're forbidden. And there are, there are uh, some strange exceptions to that, but mostly they're forbidden. When we get to molecules, we'll see phosphorescence. And phosphorescence is a triplet to singlet transition. But because it's forbidden, it takes a long time to happen. Statistically, something goes wrong and it's allowed. <laughs> so that's why the time for phosphorescence is so long. And that's where all your glow-in-the-dark paint is perfect time of year to talk about the glow-in-the-dark paint. You know, all these glow-in-the-dark things for Halloween, that's phosphorescence. That's a triplet to singlet transition that's forbidden by symmetry, so something has to come in and break that symmetry, and that's not likely, but given enough time, it's gonna happen. Think of like a three-body collision. Two-body collisions are common, they happen all the time. Three-body collisions, much less common, but they will happen, you just gotta wait for them. So symmetry breaking and this triplet to singlet transition will eventually happen, and you'll have that transition, and so that's what phosphorescence is. So we've zoomed in to the Grotrian diagram for helium. If you couldn't read my little chicken scratch, here's the answer key for all the electron configurations for this Grotrian diagram. And we see some dashed lines drawn on there for some of these forbidden transitions that can occur, but it is not uh, statistically likely. So, yes. Yeah, so this, uh, this would be one example here. This is... This is going from the sort of S column to a P column. And so S would be L equals 0, P would be L equals 1. So you see L is changing by 1, is that what you meant? Yes. Yeah. Now we're showing this one where L changes by 2, but it's a dashed line. Now that's just showing that, that there might be a tiny little intensity and that the only answer for that peak in the spectrum was this delta L equals 2 something's breaking the selection rule. It's not very likely to happen, but it does. We, like we can see this little bump in the spectrum and that's the only two energy levels that really fit that. And so they say, well, this, this is our best answer for that peak. Yes. Um, how can you tell if you have a singlet or a triplet? Do you just have to look at this diagram? Or yeah, if I were to 
the question is how do you tell how do you tell if there's a singlet or triplet and if I just give you the electron configuration you wouldn't know right if I just say 1s 2s it could be a singlet or a triplet so there's that's why there's two energy levels for that electron configuration notice on the left 1s 2s on the right 1s 2s so I couldn't tell you I couldn't say here's a 1s 2s is it a singlet or triplet you wouldn't know okay but I would I might say what are the options for a a 1s, 2s, you know, of these options, uh, singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet. You would know that it's either singlet where they're both paired or triplet where they're both unpaired. You can't get a doublet if you have two electrons, okay? You can get a doublet with an odd number of electrons where you just have one unpaired, but for an even number of electrons, your choices are singlet, triplet, just if you just have two electrons, that's it. That's all you can do. You can unpair both of them or you can pair both of them. So paired is a singlet, unpaired is a triplet. Those are your only options. Okay. Yes? Um, the Gaussian plane from 1s to, let me get square to 1s, 2s. Um, that's forbidden because delta L is plus minus 1. That's, a, the, the delta L would allow that because it's a P to an S. Okay. But the triplet singlet is forbidden because it's going from a singlet to a triplet. No, no, no. The one oh. One S two S, the one S two. Yeah, that one. This one. Up. Yeah. Straight up. Yeah. Yeah, that one's yeah that one's forbidden. It's a dashed line because delta L's zero. Okay. So it's staying in the same column, mm -hmm. and we don't see that typically. So we, once again, that that peak shows up. It's tiny. We don't know you know what's causing that peak to occur, but the general rules of delta L plus or minus one are, are very strong. Those are your strongest peaks. Now, notice down here at the bottom, this Grotrian diagram, the electron configurations are written in a funny way. 1s1, ns1. So it's allowing that n to change. And so down here at the bottom, it's 1s1, 1s1, and then 2s1, 3s1, 4s1. Do you see how it's written? And so that um, when you have 1s1, 1s1, you can just combine those and make 1s2. And so this, this fits this column. This is the con electron configuration for this whole column. So you have uh, starting at the lowest available p orbital. So that would be the 2p, then the 3p, then the 4p. And so understanding how to read those, those designations across the bottom is important for interpreting the Grotrian diagrams. Now, I'm sad because the NIST Atomic Spectral Database used to have Grotrian diagrams. We'll see some of them on the screen, uh, but they use Java script they wrote this whole beautiful thing that would generate these for every atom in the periodic table and it was great but java is insecure and a browser won't support it anymore and so all this work that they put in our tax dollars were doing a great job there and making this grotrian diagram generator but they wrote it in java and you know that whoever the virus writers and hackers you know i kicked them to the curb because they ruined a good tool by by you know constantly using, exploiting the vulnerabilities in Java. So that's, you can tell I'm bitter about that. <laughs> so looking at the top up here, I've kind of said this is an S column and this is a P column, but what do I mean by that? These are the term symbols. And so these right here have something to do with the electron configurations. Maybe you figured out that this top little number right here is the multiplicity. See, up there in the upper left, that superscript, you have ones for singlets and threes for triplets. A doublet would be a two, a quartet would be a four, a quintet would be a five. We're not going to cover any of those, but it would be a five. <laughs> We're going to probably stick to singlets and doublets and triplets just to get you, in, you know, uh, introduced into the, it's really not the shallow end of the pool, but it's shallower than the deep end. <laughs> okay. You're still going to have to swim a little. So, so let's look at the... Um, sets and, and dealing with uh, sets. Now when we talk about sets, we're talking about the curly brackets and you know you got to learn the rules by observation. You have a min value and a max value. And so we're going to talk about the term symbols and learn how to do these term symbols. Now these are only dealing with electrons in unfilled shells. So if I've got sodium, you know I've got 11 electrons. There's no way I could combine all the possible spins for 11 electrons, and it's wonderful. I don't have to. Uh, all the ones that are in the filled shells, 
all cancel each other out and are happy as can be. And we call those the core electrons. And so we're only dealing with the unpaired valence electrons in unfilled subshells. So for sodium, we just have one electron to deal with. Okay, so that's great. Out of 11, we can forget about 10 and just deal with that last electron. We get to beryllium in this column here. The subshell's filled. And so if you look here, the term symbol for the ground state atoms with filled subshells like helium, beryllium, neon, zinc, for that ground state is singlet S0. So singlet because they're paired up, S because everything again is paired up, all the spins cancel, the angular momentum of that orbital cancels, and, and we end up with the zero. So even neon. In the P orbitals, you might think that the term symbol is P, but all of those things have canceled out. So the angular momentum of the P orbital that was going in one direction, when we put electrons in the other direction, it cancels all of those angular momenta out, and you end up with an S term symbol. And so, uh, but we get to boron. So now we're at P1. Again, we just have to deal with one electron. Because once we get past that 2s orbital, those are all filled. So we're only dealing with the free electrons, the, un, the, the, the electrons in the unfilled subshell. So even though you might think boron, boron has three valence electrons, but there's only one subshell that's unfilled, and it's the p subshell. It's an important point if you think about it, because if the problem with three electrons is way harder than a problem with one electron. So if you mess that up and you've got boron and you're saying, this is a three electron system and Dr. Williams promised me we would never do one of those and this is a test and that slimy dog, you know, <laughs> I'm giving you a one electron thing and you're messing up because you're thinking you have to deal with the S electrons, but they're paired up, that subshell's filled. And so for boron, you're just deal dealing with a P1 system. Don't know. So like copper, you deal with nine electrons? Yes, it would be brutal. But here's the thing about copper, it's, it's nine, right? It's really just got one hole. So you can do the same problem but thinking about the holes and move the holes around. And so it's just got one hole left. And so you could, it's a simpler system than chromium which would, or, or manganese, which would have five. So think of all the possible ways to put five electrons in five orbitals, pairing some of times and not pairing everything. That one just blows up. But copper is much simpler than, than manganese. Yeah. What do you mean by hole? Like just the missing? Yeah, the missing electron, the, 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 un, like the, the empty chair. You know, if you have an empty chair and there's five options, you only have five, you can put the chair in the first spot, second, third, fourth, and fifth, and that's it. But if you've got, um, you know, ten chairs and five people, think of all the possible ways you could put five people in ten chairs. But if you have ten chairs and nine people, there's really not that many ways. If you can't tell the difference between the people, you just have one empty chair in one of the five, five columns that's, that's empty. Yeah. So uh, we'll see that in a second. Let's look at the Klebsch-Gordon series and how we come up with these term symbols. So we have a superscript thing, we have a big capital letter, and we have a subscript thing that follows. Where do those three pieces come from? Here's this Klebsch-Gordon series. So capital L is the total angular momentum. To review, it's the electrons in unfilled shells. So we need to think about how these, these orbitals that these electrons are in, the unfilled shells have orbitals in them, so that boron has a, has a P subshell, and we have one electron. It can be in L equals minus one, L equals zero, or L equals plus one. So sometimes, you know, L could be minus one, sometimes L could be plus one. How do we figure all of this out? And so this is, this is how we figure it out. So L goes from a minimum of L1 plus L2. We're doing this for a situation where we have two electrons. So let's think about carbon, and we'll do the carbon example. Carbon has two P electrons. And one of the, the L quantum numbers for electron 1 would be called L1, and the L quantum number for electron 2 would be called L2. So we just look at see how those, those electrons, you know, what is their L quantum number? And we're using lowercase l's for the individual uh, angular momentum quantum numbers for each of those electrons. And we couple those together to get the capital L. So how, what are the possible ways? You could draw all your little pictures. You could have 
you know, spins in the M equals zero, M, equal, M sub L equals minus one, M sub L equals plus one, and you could have all these two electrons in all of those chairs, and drawing the pictures would, again, it would be pretty easy for a P, P orbital, but, but, you know, how would you know if you got them all or if you duplicated? The Klebsch-Gordon series gets past all of that because you know if you have an electron in a P subshell, its angular momentum is one. Okay, and you've got two electrons, so L, L little L1 is one, L2 is one. You add them together, that's your max value. So added together, you would get two. Subtract, what's the difference between those two? Zero. And so that's the Klebsch-Gordon series. You go from a maximum to a minimum. So here's your max value right here. Those angular momenta added together. Here's the minimum value, those angular momenta canceling each other out. And the difference between the max and the min is just separated by one. So you subtract one to go from the max to the min. And these three dots here mean in like manner. So you take the maximum, comma, maximum minus one, comma, that number minus one, comma, keep going down until you get to the, the absolute value of the difference of these. And we use the absolute value because what if you wrote, uh, you know, L1 as smaller than L2 and you're subtracting, you get a negative number. You don't go to negatives. You just take the absolute value of the difference. Now we also need to calculate the multiplicity. So we need this S. I hate it that we have an ambiguous situation where S is used as the net spin and S is used as one of the term symbols. I, you know, I didn't invent the whole thing. This is the, what we've been given, okay? Just like in the character table, we had E for the identity operator and E for a Millikan notation row. You, it's disastrous, but you've got to pay attention. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. So in this particular context, we're calculating the net spin. And in different parts of the book, we use different um, letters for that. And, you know, earlier slides, this little S was called M sub S. And this was M sub S2. Same thing. Everybody catch that? So that's that spin quantum number on the electron. So these are easy, though, because they're all one halves, either plus one half, minus one half, etc. And so we just start with plus one half and plus one half. If we have two electrons, we call this plus one half and plus one half. So you add those together, you get one, you go down to the difference, which is zero. So most of the time, this S is going to be one comma zero. And then that allows us to calculate our multiplicity, which is going to be the singlet or triplet. Uh, triplet for, the, for S equals one and singlet for S equals zero. And then we have this last one, the J quantum number, which is the total angular momentum. Remember, we have spins of electrons and we have orbital angular momentum which is kind of like the spin of the orbital. These magnetic fields can couple with each other. So we want to capture the total angular momentum. If the orbital is spinning with the electron, you've got one result. If the orbital is spinning and the electron is going against it, think about planets. Okay, We could be orbiting the sun and spinning you know, one way or spinning the other way. And so Angular momentums couple either positive or negative, and so that's what this total angular momentum coupling is. That's the spin plus the angular momentum of the orbital, or spin minus the angular momentum of the orbital. So L plus S is your max J value, L minus S is the minimum J value. And once again, we always go in between by these minus ones. So we have the maximum coupling and the minimum coupling, and the difference is minus one, each one of those, and the three dots. Is it tedious? Yes, but it's way better than the pictures, because you just notice it's the same thing. You have a couple of things added together, a couple of things subtracted, and it's minus one, comma, minus one, comma, minus one, comma, in between, and there's three steps. You do these three steps, you get the term symbol every time. And you can label all the energy levels that way. So let's 
put it into practice. And this is what the term symbol is. When you get to the end, you have the multiplicity up on the upper left. You have the capital L term and then the J value in the lower right. So we've got some, we've got to kind of move. So let's do it by example. So let's learn by doing. So term symbol practice for one electron, it's easy because you don't have any summations. So even though we learned the summations, let's just do a single electron, pretty easy. Uh, L is equal to lowercase l1 for a single electron. So this is sodium, 3s1. What is the orbital angular momentum quantum number for that one electron? It's in an s orbital. So L equals zero for an s orbital. So our capital letter is going to be s. It's going to be a capital S for the term. Then what's the spin on that electron? Spin one half. Okay, so our net spin is one half. What's the multiplicity? Two times a half is one, plus one gives us two, so it's a doublet. So that's going to be the subscript or superscript piece in front of that S. And then the total angular momentum quantum number is L plus S going down to L minus S. We have zero plus a half going down to zero minus a half but it's absolute value. So zero plus a half is one half. Absolute value of zero minus a half is one half. So we just have one J value of one half. And so the only term is the doublet S one half for sodium. So that's gonna give us that, that term for sodium, the doublet S one half. But you see the Klebs-Gordon series, even with just one electron, it, it helps to go through the different series, you get your max and min value, and if they happen to be the same, you just have one term or one item in that set. Yes? So, uh, like you were saying before, so uh, if you ever filled um, my subshell, yes. do, does this not apply to those? No, you just ignore them. So even so, we're at sodium, and everything below sodium, that everything below that 3s1, yeah, so that's great, yeah. So let's look now if we excite that electron to a p orbital in the sodium. So it's in the p orbital, L equals one. So our capital L is one, our term is a p. And so then the spin, same thing, one half. So our spin is gonna be the same, our multiplicity is still the same, it's a doublet. But now we have, uh, since L equals one, we have some j values to deal with. We could have one plus a half down to one minus a half. So one plus a half is three halves. It helps essentially to do this, or traditionally we just keep it in halves all the way down to one minus a half, which is one half. So we have three halves as our maximum value, one half as our minimum value. And so we end up with two terms, a doublet P three halves and a doublet P one half. And we see this in the spectrum. It's well known. It's called the sodium doublet. So if you look in the spectrometer now, they've gotten better. They've reduced the amount of sodium in these lights. And so I can't really see the sodium doublet. I used to be able to see this beautiful two yellow lines with a 50 cent piece of plastic and a free cheese it cracker box. And we could see those two lines that are 0.6 nanometers apart spectroscopically. And it was beautiful, and it's a great example, but they got better, so darn it. Uh, but anyway, you can see those two spectral lines. And now let, we'll get to, um, to mercury here in a second, and then I'll pass those around. Here's the Grotrian diagram for sodium. Here's all the other transitions you have for sodium. This is the ones that come from NIST. Look how much more interesting it looks. Um, let's go on, and here's all of the answers, essentially, for the ground state term symbols. And notice when you said uh, copper, okay, it was a D9 system. Here's D9 and D1. Notice there's either one electron in those five D orbitals or one hole. And they have the same terms, W and D. Five, manganese, D5, these are all the terms we get. Even some H's and G's. So when you add up those max values, you have electron one coupled with electron two, and then electron three coupled with the results of that. Electron four coupled with the results of that. Electron five coupled with the results of that. So it just gets enormous. 
And so I don't want to ever do the D5. I don't think I would be having enough patience to do it. And these twos mean there's three ways to get the double D. There's two ways to get the double F, two ways to get the double G. So uh, this is, we've got one minute, but let's get through it, okay? This is P2. This is carbon. So we have two electrons, and both of them are in a P orbital. So both of them have an L of 1. So our max value is 1 plus 1, or 2. The min value is 1 minus 1, or 0. So 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. That minus 1 is 0. So we have 2, 1, and 0 are our three L values. And 2 is a D, 1 is a P, 0 is an S. So those capital L's tell us what letters to use for our terms. So we have three terms. What's the multiplicity? I have two electrons. They're both one half. So one half plus one half is one. One half minus one half is zero. So we have one and zero, which gives me a singlet or a triplet. Singlet for the one. I mean, singlet for the zero and triplet for the one. So these are my terms without the J values. So just those first two steps will tell me all of my terms. I have a triplet D and a singlet D, a triplet P and a singlet P, triplet S and a singlet S. Pretty easy with these sets. Once you learn the Klebsch Gordon series, it's pretty straightforward. Now we take each one of these L's and then we add in the spins of the electrons. And so we do these one at a time. This is the, probably the thing that conceptually tricks people up. We take that triplet D and we couple all the spins with it. So the D uh, means that L equals 2, and we have the net spin of 1, because it's a triplet. 2S plus 1 is 3, so S is 1. And so we have 2 plus 1 all the way down to 2 minus 1. So that series, 2 plus 1 gives us 3, 2 minus 1 gives us 1, and we have integers in between, so 3, 2, 1. So we would have, uh, let me skip ahead. We would have, that would give us this term right here. That triplet D3, triplet D2, and triplet D1 would come from this, these top three lines here. No, from these top two lines. See that? Then you pick the next term. You take, pick the singlet D. Well, singlet means S is 0. So 2 plus 0 down to 2 minus 0, we just have a 2. And so we have a singlet D2. Then for, for the triplet P, L equals 1 because of the P. S is equals 1 because of the triplet. So I have 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 minus 1 is 0. And we have integers in between. And so we have a triplet P2, triplet P1, triplet P0. And I'll let you look at the notes and see how the others work out. And here is from the NIST Atomic Spectral Database for Carbon, all of the energy levels for those carbon atoms. And what do we see? We see exactly what we just got. We have the triplet P, J equals 0, 1, 2, singlet D, 2, singlet S, 0, and those are all the ground state configurations. When I excite that to a other P orbital, I get some other options. But notice all of these are 2S2, 2P2 in some way. These are all of the energy levels, but there's only one ground state. So that's atomic spectroscopy. We label the levels, and then we can do spectroscopy between them. We can uh, review a little bit next time, and then we'll do the T spectrometer so you can see what I'm talking about with mercury.